returning viewers. I really appreciate you making some time in your day to invest in the conversation that we're having here about wool. I have an agenda for today. I am flying a little bit by the seat of my pants. I do not have show notes, but I had put together for an upcoming segment a mini uh, fiber trek, and so that's pretty much going to carry the show this time around. So this episode we have whips, works in progress. I have no finished uh, products or items, and I have some spinning and some acquisition, uh, which will look slightly familiar and probably be not that inspiring. I say that, but you know what? If you're tuning into Fiber Trek and enjoying it, you love gray wool and brown wool, and you don't need all of the vibrant, flaring colors of the self-striping and variegated indie dye world, do you? Well, if you're tuning in here, you're certainly not going to find that. So, that being said, I think I'm going to just quickly do introductions. We had one introduction in the group, and it was really a treat to uh, receive this this message in the introduction thread. This is 7 Autumn 5, and she says, I just started binge watching your episodes while I knit. I live in Indiana and the U.S. and I have been a crocheter for a few years and a knitter for less than that. But I really came into knitting when I learned to knit socks. I find that quite often. Which was around Christmas. I've been knitting furiously since so on socks plus one new project with a new technique since then. I only have stamina for a large shawl at this time and it is my goal to work up to being able to do some cardigans and sweaters. I've heard many other podcasters mention you, but I thought, oh, that's not for me. I don't spin. I just use yarn. I don't need to know where it comes from. I will be lost. Oh, I was wrong. I really love hearing about what qualities each animal's fiber have and how they can work together and why this fiber makes yarn with drape and why this one is scratchier and why this yarn is bouncy and how it's spun. Oh, so much to learn. While I do not have a desire to spin yarn, it is important to have that information when choosing a, a yarn. I understand that now. So I was so... As whenever I see um, comments that come in, I just really appreciate the feedback that there is value in the podcast content. And I, a lot of you have reached out and continue to reach out both to me and with each other in the group, sharing knowledge that I feel enriches our understanding of this work that we do, the medium that we use. And I've talked about this before. So it again, I just wanted to use Autumn's post to highlight all the great wisdom that I believe FiberTrack has pulled together into a you know or coalesced into a um, into a discussion. So it's great to have everybody here. And as I said before, uh, I was kind of poking fun at myself about the lack of <laughs> you know super awesome colorful just out there yarns, uh, if you're here, you're probably interested in that conversation. So, so thank you. Thank you for being here and thank you for supporting, again, the content that is, makes up this discussion. I don't know if that was, I don't know if that was as eloquent as I want it to sound, but basically I just wanted to say that I, I'm really, happy with the way that this group has come together and what we can offer each other. So introductions. Thanks, Autumn. That was great to hear from you. The Shackleton thread has been going crazy and I haven't been keeping up with it. I just finished a uh, midterm. And so I will talk about the Shackleton knit along a little bit when we get to that portion of the podcast. But let's just roll right into works in progress. I am working on the Scara Bray sweater and I'm working out of Peace Fleece, which is a main company that pulls uh, yarn together and has it spun based on this whole philosophy of creating relationships um, towards Peace, hence the name Peace Fleece. So through wool and through yarn and the share of craft, um, that's their mission. I'm sorry, I'm looking for a picture of Scar Bray to show you. So this sweater is a really interesting construction. I'm not going to find it there. It 
is knit from the top down and it is knit seamless, which tends to be my construction of choice. I had a nice conversation with a couple women about uh, seamless construction, which is fairly traditional. Uh, seams really came into the knitting world with the fashion world and sewing. And so fashion couture was translated into knitting patterns. And so those seams were translated as well. But when you look at traditional knitting, gansies and yokes and things, those are mostly seamless. And part of that construction really has to do with conservation and wear. So we've talked about Gansies before, the way that they're knit, so you can rip back and re-knit arms, they're knit with gussets, um, saddle shoulders. So, um, so it was interesting, I was having this conversation, I know that Amy Herzog is a huge proponent, as are a couple other designers of seam construction, but that doesn't really seem to be in my repertoire of desired skills. Although there are a number of sweaters that I'd love to knit, I just never get my desired outcome and fit on that set and sleeve. I'm interested in pursuing Elizabeth Dougherty's uh, knitting uh, set and sleeves, and I've done that before with uh, Blue Peninsula or Bonnie Sennett when I knit one of her sweaters. I got to do a knitted set and sleeve with short rows and it worked beautifully and I, and I really enjoyed that technique and I, I had that nice sharp look that I wanted without having to do the sewing. So this is Dun, da, da, da. I'm getting there. My little tangent about seams. Scarra Bray Peace Fleece by Stephanie Vanderlinden. I'm knitting this on a US 7. Um, this is what it looks like. Let's see if I can make this work with the camera. Um, it has a real nice traditional look about it. <clears throat> and this is what it looks like on the needles. So the colorway, which isn't a colorway at all, and don't be surprised, is Antarctic White. This is Peace Fleece. Uh, last time I podcasted, I had just done the saddle kind of shoulder structure, which is here. And um, I've knit down. So I knit down on this side, I knit down on this side, and then I've joined in the round. Um, so then I'll pick up here and knit the sleeves down. But there she is. And wow, I, I'm really in love with this project. And I said that last time. I just, I love the yarn. I love the way it looks. I love the relief of those stitches and the break of the fisherman rib, which is here. So this is the rib, obviously. And then this is just on the front. So you kind of get this little bit of interest and then it's straight on till morning around. And again, I, I'm just loving this yarn and I, so I've been knitting exclusively on it. 1.30, 12.30? Oh, we missed the, the noon bell. So that's good because that's 12 bells. Now we're just going to have one bell. So that is... Scarra Bray, I had said last time I was going to talk about Scarra Bray, which is an ancient site in Orkney, but I've made an executive decision in the interest of time to feature some other things. So we'll talk about Scarra Bray because, of course, I'm not done yet. And Peace Fleece, Antarctic White, Stephanie Vanderlin, and US 7. I typically go up a size in needle from the pattern because I'm a... I'm a thrower and so I tend to knit a bit tighter and I just know that I have to go up a size and I typically get gauge. My gauge on this is not consistent with row gauge so I'm I'm doing that all by measurement. I'm translating stitches per inch and I'm translating that all so I'm getting the correct um, measurements for the armholes and the shoulder, the shoulder girth or width um, and then girth as well which would be around. But uh, you can try that on, which is, again, such a bonus of the knitting top-down uh, construction. I also have on the needles a Daybreak Shawl by Stephen West. I'm knitting this out of Bare Naked Knit Spot. Um, I was a member of their club a couple years ago, and this is their Cheviot Sock Yarn. So I'm knitting this, and I'm knitting Upton Yarns her Romney Cotswold 3-ply. Both of these are 3-ply. 
<clears throat> and I'm knitting the stripes. This section will be in a gradient. So this is the beginning indigo section and I have another indigo and then I go into gray and dark brown and then, then into this. This was really the impetus, as I said before, and that's just, you're not getting really the stunning sheen on that. In the light. So this is a walnut dyed and everything else is indigo, indigo and matter and logwood. So this is finally gotten to the point where I'm, I can just knit it. I don't need to look at anything. There was a little bit of a moment where I wasn't quite sure when my increases were, but this is old school Stephen West. Sorry about the light. I thought I'd captured it well. I'll go like that maybe. <laughs> So I'm kind of puttering away on that, but again, I told you I can't, I really am having a hard time tearing myself away from that scar gray sweater. I already have plans what my next sweater is going to be, and uh, I'll talk about that, of course, when I cast it on. The other piece I have on the needles, which I don't think I made the deadline again, such a bummer, is I'm knitting the Oatmeal Stout Mittens by Stephanie Pearl McPhee, again on a U.S. I think these are a US 8, no, US 7. And I had wanted to participate in Brit Yarn and Knit British uh, Natural Shades Knit Along, and this was my contribution, although I don't think I made the deadline. But this is the second cuff. I've ripped this out three times for various reasons, and one time when I didn't even need to rip it out, but I thought I had messed up the stitch count. So... This is just a series of slip stitch patterns, and I don't know if that light helps at all, but the whole section here is all hand spun Shetland from Contented Butterfly in varying natural shades, and the um, bulk of the mitten will then be knit in my homespun Icelandic in um, kind of a, a really pretty fawn color. So that's on the needles, and I'm making progress on it. I pick it up here and there, but again, I'm in love with that Scar Bray, and I... I already want to just put more piece, another sweater's worth of piece fleece in my stash because it's just, it's just a great yarn and it's a great price. I think it's twelve dollars and seventy cents for two hundred and some odd yards. So that's the knitting. I have been spinning. I turn well, I'm I turned treated myself this year. to another wheel and I purchased a Sidekick. I was encouraged to look at that model because of my potentially transient lifestyle in the upcoming year and I wanted something that I could put in the car and was relatively easy to transport. So Jody Clayton of One Lupin and I were talking and she recommended the sidekick and I just went ahead and got it. So I've been putting that through its paces or it's been putting me through my paces. I have not tried to use that wheel in a very technical sort of way. I've really just tried to work on that wheel and begin to understand what my treadling speed is like, what is my default yarn on that wheel. Well, you're gonna, it's gonna blow your socks off when you see this. You're like, those of you who have been watching know <laughs> that I'm a pretty heavy duty worsted spinner and I love to comb and I love worsted spinning. If you don't know what that is, it is when you align all the fibers into the twist and you don't let any twist into the fiber until it's exactly drafted the way you want and then you let that in, you draft out what you want. Nothing, no spin, no twist is going into your, um, into your drafting hand. It's all controlled. I know, control. So, and then when you comb fiber, of course, you're aligning all those fibers versus a woolen, a woolen spun prep, which might be bats or roving, and then you can get into all sorts of semi this and that. That's a conversation for Judith McKenzie McEwen, though, <laughs> who is a, an amazing spinning and uh, fleece um, wise woman. So if you are interested in learning more about that, I would recommend her books and her video, Three Bags Full. She really is a heroine of the fleece world. And even if you're not, as Autumn pointed out, a spinner, you can learn a lot about your product based on what, you know, what she has to offer. So 
I was gifted by my uh, my dear friend Jenny Estelle of Starcroft some fiber unknown at this moment although I'm sure I can get the information <clears throat> but I know you don't be don't be alarmed <laughs> these are I think four ounce um, balls of roving and I have a pound to date I've spun eight ounces but it's just a really beautiful brown color. She thought I maybe needed some brown versus the charcoal and gray palette I've tended to hang around in. And she was right, it really spun up quite gorgeously. So this is the prep that I was working with and I literally just pulled it out and spun it from here. I didn't pre-draft it, I didn't do anything to it. I just spun it from the, the roving state. And this is what I came up with, which isn't worsted at all. This, or lace weight, this is 164 yards, eight ounces of, I would say a bulky two-ply woolen spun. I know, it's like magic. I got this wheel and all of a sudden I was like, I don't care, twist, do what you want. Like even at moments I was just like, I wasn't even using this hand. I was literally just holding this and just gently working with resistance of the wheel, I don't know if that's correct or not, and letting it on, and I would pull it off and let it on, and there was twists going everywhere. There were lumps, I know, it bothers me. But Judith Mackenzie McEwen does say that those bumps will work themselves out in the plying, and she's exactly right. You cannot see any of that. I am so chuffed with this spinning project. I have never spun anything like this before. And it was like a whole new personality. And I thought that was so interesting when I moved from my Lendrum, which was so different. And I, it, I was trying to explain to my husband about these wheels. <clears throat> and he's a paddler. We both paddle, but he's a serious paddler. He's in charge of the boats. And when I say paddle, I'm talking about canoeing, although he is um, an avid sea kayaker. I haven't done that yet. but. Anyway, boats are his thing. So we were talking about the difference in these wheels and and wheels in general, because I started out with a Louette. So with the Lendrum, there's different materials that we make boats out of, and they have different, obviously, they have different uses. So you're not going to take a Kevlar boat, which is a real lightweight boat and that you get the light weight from the Kevlar material, which is um, fragile, for lack of a better word, and a carbon fiber, kind of-ish, if you will. So you're not gonna take that on a big, massive, rocky river trip per se, because you have a lot of opportunity for bottoming out, you're running rapids, and this thing is gonna wrap and crumple pretty easily. So, you know, it's a very, but it is a very fast boat. It's a Kevlar fast boat. When you're in this boat, you can go for it. And it requires a lot a lot more control because it's lighter weight, right? So you gotta do a lot more steering, you gotta do a lot more finesse, you gotta pay a lot more, you know, attention. And um, but you we have used this mostly for kind of lake paddling. And then you have um, your fiberglass. Um, the the uh, words escape me now, and I know I'm trying to be articulate about it, but I'm thinking about like old town canoes, if you're familiar with that, like like discoveries, discos we call them, and those things are kind of like, that's what you put the Boy Scouts in when you're going to run the Allagash, which is a wilderness waterway, or you're going to do something new with a summer camp. Like these are just solid dog boats, and they do dog it a bit, right? So they require a little bit more hump, they're, but they're more reliable and they tend to track a little bit better because they've got a little bit more weight. So they are a little bit more stable. And then you have things in between. So I was talking to Rob about the wheels and kind of like the sidekick being the Kevlar boat, right? This fast wheel that, you know, travels easy and it's lightweight and you know it's kind of got this spunk and spark to it versus my Lendrum which I kind of equated to like a disco like solid stable more control you know you can I don't know this is an analogy I was just trying to use to help him understand these different levels because 
he was highly supportive of, well, he's highly supportive of whatever I bring into the house typically for fleece and yarn and, uh, and, and equipment. But he was trying to understand why I would get this wheel and why we would broaden our repertoire of equipment to this wheel. So I was trying to help him with that analogy. So it was really kind of funny, you know, boats and spinning wheels and how they work <laughs> together. So it's just interesting that when you change your equipment, and, and Judith McKenzie talks about this, you don't necessarily change who you are as a spinner. You can change your technique, but I definitely subscribe to the way she thinks about your body mechanics and how you are, and but you can make your wheel work for you too. And you can make that wheel work for you by changing your take up, um, you know, changing the um, the ratios on the wheel. So those, so making your wheel work for you to get the results that you want. I think I'm more in that camp at the moment because I'm not changing myself as a spinner per se. I may be loosening up a little bit of my grip on the fiber, but but really, I think this wheel is so fast. I don't think I had time. I think I was just like, oh my God, I gotta get it on. Uh, and so I was able to achieve something very different. It smells really good. So that was a tangent about this spinning. I, I have a feeling this is some sort of Romney-esque um, breed. Longer wool, not short stapled. Let's see. So that was eight ounces. I have another eight I'm going to start spinning. And again, I'm just trying to put that through. I'm just trying to get used to that action on that wheel. I forgot to mention, I have been working on, uh, I'll put this kind of in its own like little separate, I'm working on crafty things because uh, we're still kind of in that segment. Um, I have been working on my Sami bracelets. And this one is going to be for my husband. I have simply, I've got the leather all cut, so I'm just going to basically take this, mount it on this piece of reindeer hide, and then I will stitch it down. And that will be done, and I have, I have a, uh, more to do. I had more material brought over from my friend in Sweden, um, Sandykins, and so I have more to do, and I would like to get, I'd like to put this out where I can see it so that I'm just working on it. So that's really it for works in progress and things that I've been focusing on. Acquisitions and discoveries, well, aside, you saw some of the items that Jannie gave to me. I did pick up, when I was um, at shearing day with Bybrook Farm, some of Persia's fleece. I had three ounces of, of this and I've decided to knit the tails from the Isle of Purebeck shawl and hand spin for it and I've decided to do it out of this Persia uh, gray um, as they say in um, Britain, it, she, I think she's kind of a, oh no, she's, she's a Romney. I thought she was kind of a mule of she's unknown ancestry. But anyway, I'm just really in love. Of course it's long wool. It's got the luster. Look at that. And I just makes me happy. So I will attempt to do a little woolen spun two ply DK with that and I will probably put it on <laughs> my sidekick because it looks like I can actually do something on my sidekick that's fairly different. The other discovery I made is and I wanted to share with you is that Jody Clayton of One Lupin or Main Yarn and Fiber Supply is going to be starting a club and featuring main curated yarns and I wanted to take an opportunity to give you that information. If you're interested in highlight some of the great work that's happening here in Maine. So I'm gonna just cut to that and let her tell you about it. And then we'll be back with Wool Heroes and Heroines. So I just wanted to give Jody a chance to talk a little bit about a really exciting project she is uh, going to be launching here in a couple weeks um, for a club. But I'm gonna let you talk about that, uh, which is gonna feature some of these really amazing fiber stories from around the state. So Jody, can you tell me a little bit about what you're going to do with some particular pieces that you are curating right now? Yes. And this is a great example. This is Melancus from Bybrook Farm. Beautiful, nearly black, long, gorgeous Romney fleece with crimp to die for. What I'm going to be doing is do a four-month subscription-only yarn club 
from July through October, each month will feature a skein of single farm yarn from a specific breed and all natural color, so four in all. And there will be a story about the farm and the shepherd or the shepherdess and the animals and the land. So each month you'll learn a little bit about a different farm in Maine raising a strong wool breed. Awesome. So Rami being an example. Yes, Malankis is designated for that. But he will only be available through this subscription through that club. club. And I'm releasing and there'll be limited number of spots and when it's sold out, it's sold out and we'll have that up on the website by um, by March 15th. Okay, so people are interested, they can go to your website, which mm -hmm. is One Lupin, and that'll be linked in the show notes, and they can order right online. Correct. Awesome. Well, it's such an exciting project, and I'm I'm so happy that there are producers like Michelle and curators like yourself that are um, allowing people to really sample what Maine has to offer um, for fiber, because I feel like it is a very unique experience, whether you're harvesting from islands off the coast or a rustic county right, right up here at the Canadian border. Um, it's just nice to see this work going out into the broader community. So if you're interested, you can find links. All right, so Wool Heroes and Heroines, we've just talked to Jody. We're going to see her again and we can talk more about her work. And we're also going to be meeting Michelle Bai of Bybrook Farm. So we'll be heading up to Linnaeus, Maine for shearing day. And we, she has a hand spinning flock. All of the, as you will learn, all of the fleeces are hand spinning fleeces. The reason I chose this for the Wool Heroes and Heroines segment, oh, and Jannie Estelle Starcroft is there and kind of behind the scenes, she did some of the camera work. So kudos, th thank you, Jannie, for, for that great direction and production skill you brought to the table. So the inspiration for this Wool Heroes and Heroines came kind of from a, an Instagram post of a person who was getting ready to release some curated yarns and they had used this word waiting kind of continually throughout the post regarding the fleece and the yarn and and that's great you know I mean, it's exciting and it and it builds this anticipation around this gorgeous yarn and I let it go and I kept flipping through and then I started to think about that word waiting and my experience with sheep particularly. And I feel really passionate about the work and the work of shepherding and shepherdessing and the work of the animal. And I think that's, I, I've said this before, that's what really drives my decision making and the way in which I approach the medium for my craft and for my making. So I view this, you know, I view this as action. It's not a passive experience. I don't, I'm not waiting. And I'm intricately involved in the value of this work and it's work. Uh, it's not just, um, taking fiber off an animal. Many of you who watch own animals. You own dairy goats, you own you even own cats and dogs, and that requires a level of engagement and awareness. And so when we just take that to the shepherding and shepherdessing world, there's a whole other piece that goes into growing fiber. It is it is you are cultivating fiber and you're doing that through nutrition. You're doing that through attention to um, confirmation of the animal, um, through understanding disease, through assessing the health of your animal by sight. Um, you can look at animals and know where they're at. Uh, I have people who've been able to look at cows and just the way they hold their ears and realize that they're not well. Even way before massive infection shows itself or you know, before they're down or whatever, before the obvious signs. So there's like a wisdom that's cultivated there, both in the steward and then there's this piece that the animal's going to do, which is grow fiber, which is gonna, you know, convert, how well can I convert sugar and protein and carbohydrates into this? So now we've got, now we're not just looking at the animal, we're, we're looking at our land base, we're looking at 
forage and how well our animal can access that forage. How are we going to coax, you know, this fiber out of this animal using these genetics? So there's a lot of planning and assessing and evaluating. And then there's the hands-on piece, which can be very grim at times and hard. And then there's, of course, the heartwarming, you know, the heartwarming moments and the sun and lambs and all those great things. So I felt like I wanted to kind of capture a little bit of that work, that value piece in this Wool Heroes and Heroines. And I couldn't think of any better way to do that, to highlight it. There's a lot of people in this state that are Wool Heroes and Heroines of mine that do this work. But I had the opportunity to be with Michelle at her farm and so I thought we would we would start there. So we're not just going to only learn a little bit about shearing. We're also going to learn how to skirt a fleece for hand spinning. And and you will I didn't do a running commentary, but you will see a sheep sheared. It's and you're going to see uh, feet being trimmed. We do that. I've talked about it before. We do that to make sure the animal doesn't develop any foot trouble, such as foot rot or their hooves can grow over, which makes it hard for them to walk, so we keep that trimmed. And, and of course, then that better enables them to get around and get to their food. So you'll see some foot trimming. You'll see some unconventional foot trimming. I end up trimming feet. This animal is happy to stand, so I'm like trimming feet while it's standing. Typically, the shearer started uh, trimming. You'll see that animal still held in the kind of shearing position on its, on its bum cradled kind of cradled in your legs with the head up here and then you just you trim feet that way but this animal was happy to stand so I took advantage of that because it was a large sheep that I didn't want to have to flip over so so you'll see that you'll see the shearer you see the foot trimming you'll see the fleece skirting and then we'll be talking about uh, like I said the, the skirting of the fleece so I hope you enjoy this segment and I will see you on the other side
to Mini Fiber Trek up to Bybrook Farm. We're looking at one of Michelle Bye's Ramis. I'm here with Jody Clayton of Maine Yarn and Fiber Supply. And I just wanted to give you a little insight into what happens as we move towards yarn. Uh, Jody curates um, Maine yarns and rovings from uh, producers like Michelle. So I thought I would just hand this over to Jody to talk a little bit about the process that happens after shearing, which you got to see a little bit beforehand. So. Jody, can you tell us a little bit about what you're doing? Yes. What we're doing is something called skirting. And this sheep is named for the fleece from the sheep, is uh, what we're working on. Her name is Valentine. She's a Romney U. This will be my second year uh, getting this fleece. So yesterday she was sheared. She's on a skirting table, which allows material oh, to yeah. fall through. And we're in Michelle's basement here. See that? And so what we're doing is we are, we've opened up the fleece carefully and we are taking off the pieces that are less desirable and those might include areas of, that are called the bridge, which is around the back end, so manure tags, super coarse fiber, anything that has been felted on the animal, which is also called cotting. We're also looking for super irregular wool on here, uh, any leg wool left, belly wool, any little bits of chaff or hay. We're trying to make this as clean and presentable as possible, either for purchase as a whole fleece by hand spinner or, in my case, to be sent up to a mill here in northern Maine and turn into beautiful yarn. I want to make it as easy for them as possible. Awesome. Plus, then we just get to play with it. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if I can just bring Michelle over really quickly. She's a fan of the podcast and um, has been a real generous supporter both um, with fleece and vending at our retreats, which she'll be returning to Highlands on the Fly. But can you just maybe give a little insight to how many sheep you have and what you do with them? <laughs> I have 21 Romney um, hand spinning sheep and started as a whim. Had to have these two cute lambs and it has exploded and 20 plus years later. <laughs> Here we are <laughs> in my basement. <laughs> and all, all your pieces are spoken for. They are. Yep. They're, they're all They've sold. already found homes. Yeah. Um, but, uh, and we're happy that Jody got a few of them. I have Malunkus, but last year's clip sitting at my house ready to spin. And I'll be taking home some more Persia, which is your neighbor's sheep. Yes. Um, so you <laughs> I've done very well this weekend. Um, but yeah, so we're going to head back to the show. Thank you. Uh, Michelle, and thank you, Jody, for sharing some insight to what we're doing. And Janny of Starcraft is behind the camera. Hi, <laughs> and um, yeah, so more information on where you can find um, supplies like these later in the show. Well, I hope you enjoyed meeting Michelle and Jody uh, up at Bybrook Farm and just a little glimpse into uh, Shearing Day. I have uh, I have plans for my next Wool Heroes and Heroines, so we'll see if I'm able to put that together and, and do another video clip because it was really fun to actually have footage versus just tell you about something. I think on that note, I'm going to sign off. The uh, home swap, the home port swap is uh, on its way and doing fine. Uh, there are some events. If you're interested in the retreats, you can certainly check out our Ravelry group and I will see you in two weeks. I know I'm supposed to say something here. I rock knits. Um, whatever fiber journeys you embark on, may you return with fiber and yarn? Is that what I'm supposed to say? Let me see if I can bring it up very quickly because it was such a good one. And in my socially pragmatic challenge self, um, I think it'd be nice to sign off with, with a great tagline. Goodbye for now. And may all your treks include fiber and bring you back home safe. Bye. Sit in that seat, staring out the window. And if that bell would ring, then outside we would go. It's time to go to the playground. Let's all run, run to the playground. We can dance down to the playground. Slide. Or see me on the song We don't want to go back inside